and the digital coin of the futures. Now, cryptocurrency is a digital currency recorded in a ledger of accounts and transactions between peers using a system of verification and encryption. Transactions are made by sharing public passwords attached to private and encrypted digital wallets. Each password relates back to a block of transactions on a digital ledger called a, big, a block chain and represents some amount of digital coins. Well, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? And it really didn't explain much to anybody. So I'm going to try to give you a real basic example that we can kind of follow along. Imagine your debit card. Your bank gives you put money in the bank and you have a debit card that draws it out. Or imagine, let's even go back easier. Let's imagine a gift card. Okay. A MasterCard gift card, a Visa gift card, a gift card. Now, let's go back when I was a youngster, a long time ago. If somebody, my grandparents, wanted to give me a gift card, say, to buy school clothes in the fall, they would go into the store that my mother shopped in and say to the woman, I want to buy a $100 gift card. And they would hand the clerk in the counter the $100, and they would hand them a embossed, nicely written certificate that said it had a $100 value. There was no name on it. It wasn't attached to anything. And I could, my grandparents would then give it to me for a gift. In turn, I'd give it to my mother. When we went into the store to go shopping, she'd present this certificate to the clerk. The clerk would use it to pay the bill. Now, because there wasn't any computer records, it was a long time ago before computerized service, before internet. It was only good in that one store where we bought it. And it was only good for a single transaction. So most of the time, the stores would be spent $87. They would hand you back $13 in real money. Or they'd say you have to spend more than what's on the card. And my mother would spend the $112 and give the woman the certificate and the $12. Now, first of all, that was a completely anonymous transaction from my grandparents' purchase to my purchase because there was no names attached to it. There was no identity. But the fact is, if my mother lost that certificate, there was no way to reclaim it. It was just money that disappeared because the money did no longer exist. The money was exchanged at the store whenever my grandparents went in the store. That was it. Well, time moved forward, time moved forward, time moved forward. And we got to the point where the stores were issuing gift cards because they had registers that attached. And you could use a gift card to any register in any store that they had because it stored the value of whatever was placed on that card. And I could use $50 of the $100 one day and go back the next day, but only within that store. And again, it was anonymous. There's no record. I could hand the card to my grandparents, and then my grandparents could give it to my aunt, and my aunt could give the rest of the balance to her, her son. And whoever had that card would have access to those funds. Well, kind of with cryptocurrency, that's kind of what happens. It does take some type of physical action to get the value of the cryptocurrency. In other words, somebody along the line either has to earn it, like miners do, which we'll talk about, or like me and you, and we have to use our credit card or bank transfer, and we buy it. It's put on a balance somewhere, an anonymous balance, put on like a certificate or that gift card. Now, I can hand that gift card to you and you can hand it off to somebody else and you can hand it off to somebody else. And that Bitcoin or that card just circulates and nobody knows who it's attached to. There's no records, it's anonymous. 
But that's the same thing that happens when once you buy the Bitcoin, instead of being put on a certificate or card, it's put into your wallet. You can then move it from your wallet in any amount you want to somebody else's wallet. But the only thing you have is an anonymous person's wallet. So in other words, today, somebody paid me $2,000 in Bitcoin. I had to call my three clients and ask, did this come from you? Because there's no record for me to see. All I see is a transaction number and an encrypted number. So it's like money moving around on those gift cards. So let's take that gift card one step farther. We now moved up to where we have Visa and MasterCard gift cards. So you go in to the local drugstore, you go into the local st store, whatever, and you go in and buy a $100 gift card with Visa and MasterCard. So now there is a not a record of you, but there's a record of that card and that transaction. And you can use that card number on the internet to buy stuff. You can use it on the phone to buy stuff. You can share it. You can do whatever you want. And there's also a record. You can go online and type in that number and pull up the, the outstanding balance. You can see the charges. Uh, only, though, if you have that number and the, the ID that goes, you know, the, the little three-digit number or four-digit number on the back. Otherwise, you can't get to see it. It's anonymous. And on that gift card, it's also digital money. If it is, it tells you there's $20 on that gift card, it's $20, okay? If it tells you you have one-eighth of a Bitcoin, you will always have one-eighth of a Bitcoin. It's just what the value of that Bitcoin is, and that's what we have to talk about. It's the value of that Bitcoin because you own a half of, say you own a whole Bitcoin. Well, if you own a whole Bitcoin, in the real world, it is worth whatever Bitcoin is worth that day. Now, if you owed me one Bitcoin, you'd have to pay me with one Bitcoin. But if you owe me $25,000 right now, or say today $22,000, you would give me a half a Bitcoin. Because I'm you owe me in dollars. You're paying me in Bitcoin. It's no different. If you think about it, it's no different than if you owed me dollars, but you were in Australia, you would have to convert your Australian dollars. You wouldn't owe me 25 US, you'd owe me 25 US dollars, which is 35,000 Australian dollars. Now, it happens to be that what we call fiat currency doesn't move up and down in value that much. It moves, but very, very small amounts because it's controlled by the government. It's controlled by the economy. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't have 10 euros in your bank account or you say your paycheck was 3,000 euros and you needed to pay your rent, your insurance, your, your lights, everything else. And basically... They should always be the same thing. And at the end of the month, when you pay everything, you end up with a thousand euros left over. And that's your spending money for the month. But if the euro crashed and all of a sudden the value of the euro went down, your landlord says, No, you owe me 1,400 euros right now, not 1,000. And you went in the grocery store and everything had gone up in price and it was taking more euros. And the light bill was fluctuating. It would be very tough for you because the end of the month, maybe you don't end up with any euros. So remember, cryptocurrency essentially is a digital ledger of transactions secured by cryptographic codes that act as a decentralized currency. Okay. So cryptocurrency is the ledger. Okay. Or, you know, that online account where you go to, that's stored somewhere. Whatever bank or whatever licensee had issued that card has a whole ledger of those of all the transactions and everything that happened on that. It's secured by security in Bitcoins or a cryptocurrency case. It's cryptographic codes. Now, cryptography is a way that was developed during World War II for secret messages. Okay. It's an involved, complicated formula or yeah, I guess formula for secrecy. And in this case, these secret codes are done with what we call keys. Our wallet, 
where we store our cryptocurrency, which is basically, say, hypothetically, it's that digital number on your credit card is a very long number. That's a secret key to your account. Because basically, if I wanted to pay you $50 or $500, and I knew your credit card number, I could pay to that credit card number without ever knowing your last name, without ever knowing your address or anything else, because that's a digital number. Well, in cryptocurrency, those wallets and those accounts and those digits don't tie back to anybody. They're anonymous. And if you think of the decentralized currency and the big, the miners in the blockchain, think of it as Visa's processing center. Every time you use that gift card or you use your credit card, for a matter of fact, it goes through an entire network so that whoever, whatever you're charging gets put onto your account, whatever is owed goes onto that account, but somebody has to even give the credit approval and everything else. And that goes through complex networks that tie back the credit on your account to the, to the place making the charge. So hypothetically, you live in California and you're in London and you swipe that credit card, it needs to go through that long network process, which takes you know a second. But think of that as the blockchain. So that credit card number is your digital wallet. The credit card number is your cryptographic code. And the network or the blockchain that's processing all the transactions is the Visa MasterCard network or system. But because Visa and MasterCard network system are all privately owned, and have lots of information to get the credit card. You have to have it, your name and your address and everything else. Okay. It's slightly different. Okay. Now, so Bitcoin is a digital currency. That's all it is. It's an amount put onto a wallet. Now, Bitcoin is the granddaddy of them all. It's also when we talk about Bitcoin, the rest are all called altcoins, and most of them aren't what we call currency. They were never, they are not established for e-commerce, so to speak. They're not established for paying things for uh, and doing it. They are established for other reasons. But thinking about Bitcoin, it's a digital currency. When you use your credit card or you use that gift card, there was no money transactions. It was a whole bunch of digital things getting approved. Happens to be it's tied back to a credit limit that's given to you in dollars or pounds or whatever else. If your digital currency or your, your credit card had five euros on it, I'm sorry, it had five bitcoins, okay, you could spend or use those five bitcoins. Now it's no different than if you had a US credit card in dollars and you went to Japan and you were buying in yen. There is a conversion, there is a fact, a, a number that is valued at that time. Now, as a digital currency used to make payments of any value without fees. Now, this is what Bitcoin and digital currency tried to tell us. But in order to have these digital currencies, especially Bitcoin, that you have to have a wallet that stores them. You have to have the miners in the blockchain who process them. And therefore, all of those people are charging money and making profits. In the beginning, the whole idea of miners, who are the ones who are actually processing the transactions, are paid in, in Bitcoin, in tiny little percentages of Bitcoin. But they found that more and more people that use Bitcoin, the more and more energy these computer systems, these big computer miners were using, and the more expensive it was getting to the point where the miners keep raising their fees. Now they've even gotten to the point where you have to pay processing fees. And depending on the size of the processing fee, it's the speed of the transaction. 
So basically, we've gotten back to almost just like banking. The miners control everything. And I had a transaction not long ago that took, it was a very, very busy day. It was when cryptocurrency was soaring. And it took almost 24 hours for the transaction to come. Now, the, the funny part is you can see it coming instantly, but it takes seven verifications for it to actually be good. And we'll, we'll explain this in a second. But it took 24 hours to get this. No different than somebody being like a bank wire and sending to me. So the idea that it's free, the idea that wallets don't charge you any fees, the idea is that it doesn't cost you any money to transfer these money, is all malarkey today. It costs you a lot. It costs you a lot to get the Bitcoins to convert from cryptocurrency, and it costs you a lot to move it back into fiat currency, but it costs you just every time you pay. Because everybody involved in the process of making money. So, in order to stop the anonymous part of it, the exchanges are being forced to be regulated. So, I might want to give you a Bitcoin. I might want to disperse my wealth. In Bitcoin, I might want to get some tax free income in Bitcoin. But the fact is, anybody, once you have a mass Bitcoin, you can move it any which way you want and the people can have it. But there really isn't any way to really spend any great deal of it. So you need to put it, get it into an exchange that's regulated that has the, the right, the legal right, to either move it back onto a, it's converted back to fiat currency, to convert it into money. Because you either need to put it onto a credit card as a credit, or you need to transfer back to your bank. And they can't do that without being regulated. Being regulated means they've got your ID, your information, and you've been approved. So this anonymous stuff is a bunch of hogwash. Now, let's talk about the distributed public ledger called blockchain. Now, blockchain, like I said, is like the network, the Visa MasterCard network, except this is a decentralized, there is no Visa MasterCard. It's a network of miners. Now, these miners' jobs aren't is to dig for gold. They verify the transactions. Every transaction from Bitcoin has to be verified. It has to be verified by a miner and then, then oh my, I forget the other word for it, but then be verified by several different miners. So the miner who make, does the fastest processing and is all a bunch of cryptographic keys and numbers. So say my wallet needs to, you know, we've got 20 people with Bitcoin, we're all paying this and they, they put it together into a block and send it out to the ledger. That block has to be verified with a whole bunch of involved cryptography. And once it's all verified, it's then posted on all the public ledgers. That means your transaction with your bank on Visa card, in this case, Visa and the bank are the only ones who store it, the only ones who have the identity, means that it's, it's not, they're the only ones who can verify it, okay? In the blockchain, these public ledgers and there's no name, there's nobody's name anywhere. It's these long cryptographic numbers that are signed to your wallet. And every transaction is stored and verified by every public ledger. So that means nobody can really defraud anybody because if it's not on all the public ledgers, then it can't be approved. So it means you can't sneak away a transaction, you can't under hide away a transaction. So Bitcoin works on a public ledger called blockchain, which holds all the decentralized records of all the transactions that is updated and held by for use by the network. To create Bitcoins, users must generate blocks on the network. Each block is created cryptographically by harnessing users' computer power and is then added to the blockchain, letting users earn by keeping the network running. Now, Bitcoin is, has a range of uses, including funding companies, investing cash, transferring money without fees. It is 
commonly associated with criminal activity such as drug dealing, cybercrime, and money laundering. Well, this is what everybody used to say about this because you could have secret transactions. But the fact is, this drug dealer, this criminal, stole diamonds, went to the fence, the fence paid him with, with you know, laundered cash, and he's got a million, a hundred thousand dollars in cash. He want, in order for him to get Bitcoin, he's got to find somewhere to buy. Now, granted, there are people that you can find on the streets who've got a hundred or two hundred Bitcoins in their wallet, and you hand them the hundred thousand in cash, they'll transfer it over to you, and then it becomes completely anonymous. But that was no different than you still had the hundred thousand dollars in your hands. You know, you wanted to pay off your partners, you could. Put, you know, drive across town and give them the money, or you could put it in blocks in, in Bitcoin. So it's a bunch of hogwash because today, with regulation, everybody, in order to get it in and get it out, you're being identified. Now, one of the advantages to cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoin, and the reason you see Bitcoin's price sailing is because there is a maximum amount of Bitcoins that can ever be issued, and that is just about 21 million Bitcoins. And there are currently a little bit more than 15 million in circulation. And the only way a Bitcoin becomes in existence is if a small, tiny portion of the Bitcoin is paid through the, the network to the miners for verifying all these transactions and keeping the network running. Small, tiny amounts. But eventually, and not so far down the road, we're going to use up a lot more of those Bitcoins. But it used to be Bitcoin was only worth $100. Now it's worth $45,000. So the miner gets a much smaller percentage or piece of the Bitcoin. But as the supply of Bitcoin dries up and we get more and more users, because what happened was, you know, five years ago, eight years ago, yeah, some enthusiasts and some cool people knew about it, but that was it. Now, grandma's opening up her wallet and buying a Bitcoin because she wants to give it to her grandson. She wants to seem cool. I've got three Bitcoins. I don't really trade in Bitcoin. Now, I have some clients who pay me in Bitcoin, but I still convert it back into my dollars. But well, several years ago, one of my clients asked me to start teaching on how to buy Bitcoin, how to use wallets, how to use exchanges. And I didn't really know that one. We're talking about a lot, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012. So I opened up several different wallets and in each one I bought a Bitcoin and put it in there. Bitcoin was $200. Well, those three Bitcoins were sitting there because the hardest thing is I couldn't get it back out. One, one wallet I paid with my PayPal account bought the Bitcoin after I taught the class, I wanted to get it back. I taught, you know, filled out the form to send it back to my PayPal account. And they told me I was money laundering. I said, I just put it in there with PayPal. I want it back into my PayPal. No. So I just let it sit. Well, fortunately, Bitcoin went way up in value. But this is one of the problems with Bitcoin being a currency. Because it's very hard to shop or use something that the value is continually changing. You know, Bitcoin climbed from $20,000 to $57,000 in a matter of days. Okay. Well, that's very nice if you had Bitcoin. But the fact is a store who's accepting Bitcoin is accepting it the current market value. So say, for instance, last Thursday, you sold somebody Oh, God does what? Let's, let's use a big nail car. And Bitcoin was trading at $57,000. The car was, say, $57,000. So you transferred one Bitcoin. Well, you got the car the next morning, got on a lot, drive, drove down the street, and you had your $57,000 car. But by the time they processed all the paperwork and went to transfer that Bitcoin out of their wallet into their bank account and converted to dollars, Bitcoin is only worth $54,000. So in essence, they sold you a car for 57. You paid them what was 57 at that moment. But by the time they got it into cash in their account, it was only worth 54. So in other words, it would be no different if you went to the bank 
you went to the dealer and wrote him a check for fifty seven thousand dollars. You know, he doesn't matter if he holds it for three days, five days, seven days, nine days. When he takes it to the bank, it's worth fifty seven thousand dollars. With Bitcoin, today it's only worth forty four thousand dollars. So if he didn't run to the bank instantaneously the minute he got and converted it into his local currency, he could be out of money. Now, if it happened to be that Bitcoin was at $54,000 and you bought a car for 54 and you transferred to Bitcoin, that would be before he went to the bank, it went to 57. Well, he made some extra money. But he's not in the business of dealing Bitcoin and monitoring currency. He's in the business of selling cars. So it becomes a problem when we talk about using this as a currency. Just like any other currency, from the U.S. dollar to the money in your PayPal account, currency primarily has value because we all agree it has value. Meanwhile, secondary factors include a limited supply, a demand for it, use value in the economy that accepts it in terms of exchange value because there is work behind it. The same is true for cryptocurrency. It has little inherent use value with the same being true of bank credit in a bank account, but it nonetheless has value in the modern economy. We agree it has value for whatever set reasons, thus we can, be tr we can trade it for other things in real world value, for goods and for services. With that in mind, although it is like centrally backed state issued fiat currency in many ways, there is are notable differences. The main difference being it isn't backed by a central government, it isn't regulated by a central bank, and you can't use it to pay for your taxes. It's not legal tender. So what terms do you need to understand? You need to understand blockchain, you understand miners, you understand wallets and exchanges. Well, we haven't really touched, we've talked, a wallet is an electronic storage facility. It is where you can supposedly safely store your Bitcoins. Now, there is a fallacy out here. Okay. A wallet, today, many, many, many wallets are associated with exchanges. And they're not separated items. Now, for instance, I have a wallet that has no exchanges, it's nothing. It's there to hold my cryptocurrency and to move it out and move it in. There's no trading available, there's no f changes of, of, of values, there's no nothing. It holds and protects my currency. It's like, imagine mixing your checking account, your credit card account, and your savings account. That's what's happened today. With well, your savings account, is insured by the government and protected, and it's very, very safe. Once you mix it all together, it's not as safe. An exchange is where you would go to exchange, whether it's fiat currency or for other different cryptocurrencies. Like you think Ethereum's gonna go up and Bitcoin's gonna go down, you wanna change all your coins over to Ethereum, you do that on an exchange. You move the money in and out of your wallet, but you do the transaction on your exchange. Now today, for convenience purposes, many exchanges, offer wallets, but when hackers are going to go after something, they usually go after the, ex the wallets on exchanges because they're easier to hack into huge amounts of money, where individual wallets, they would have to hack into my particular wallet to get my money because there's no other transactions going on on that wallet. So a wallet is a place you store your money, and there's also cold storage and hard storage. So because cryptocurrency has gone up so high in value, I've moved my money, my crypto, my, my whole three Bitcoins, but today that's $125,000 over into what we call a Tezos wallet. Tezos wallet is a USB stick that's only usable when I put the USB stick into my computer. And I've also got it, you know, and then I still have to put in all the code, but it's not accessible by anybody else. And I have to have that USB special stick into my computer. Okay. Then we also have cold wallets, which are like the Tezos wallet. Then you have semi-hot and cold wallets. And then you have the exchange wallets. 
But for someone to make a transaction using Bitcoin, the transaction must be submitted to the community. This is the miners and ledgers. That transaction data includes public passwords that relate back to the private ones. So the transaction is both anonymous and encrypted. Once the transaction data is public, community members can collect and verify the data and attempt to crack a very difficult computation puzzle that allows the transaction to be added to the public ledger. But nothing is tied back to you and me. It's all of these long, long, long codes or our keys to our wallet. So as you may have picked up at this point, Bitcoin mining has very little to do with mining. Bitcoin mining is just one of the more com or more computers cracking the cryptographic puzzle to add the transaction to the blockchain. When transactions are added to the public ledger or the blockchain, new coins are created or they're called mined. Tiny little coins that are paid to the miners. Bitcoin mining is an integral part of how Bitcoin works. The Bitcoin network relies on miners to verify and update the public ledgers of Bitcoin transactions to verify that Bitcoin users aren't trying to cheat the system and to add newly discovered Bitcoins to the money pool. The entity that verifies the transaction adds it to the ledger is called the miner. This is because when a transaction is added to the ledger, new coins are created and given to the entity as part of the fee. So in order to add transactions to the block led chain, all the miners collect the transactions recently broadcast to the other blockchain users, verify that the transactions are valid, and compile them down to, into a transaction block, a condensed record of all the transactions for that period of time. Of course, if any miner could simply create a transaction block and immediately add it to the permanent ledger, then anyone who wanted to create a fake transaction block and add it to ledger could. Because of this, the Bitcoin algorithm is designed to make mining difficult. Instead of being able to add a transaction block to the blockchain at will, a miner has to solve a very complicated computational puzzle called the proof of work scheme. This proof of work scheme was designed to have solutions that are easy to verify, but very difficult to find. In other words, what Bitcoin miners are actually doing is competing with each other to see who can solve the difficult cryptographic puzzle for each block. And whoever solves it first is the one who's paid for that. The other ones just have to verify it. When one miner finds the solution to the problem, they broadcast the solution to all the other miners. The other miners then verify that the solution is correct. If it is, the network permanently adds the successfully mined block to the publicly accepted blockchain. And those transactions are forever and shared publicly, but nobody knows who they belong to. The miner who won the mining race and was the first to successfully solve the puzzle is then rewarded for the efforts with 25 newly discovered Bitcoins. This possibility of, of rewards acts as an incentive for miners to keep investing computational time and efforts into mining. This new creation a Bitcoin also acts as a way to add to the overall Bitcoin money supply. Now, the 25 newly discovered were what was originally done in 2008 because there were very few miners and you had to interest the miners. As the value of Bitcoin went up and up and up, the system and all of this is predetermined in the initial layout of Bitcoin. There's nothing that has changed or changed in history. Now we have fork. You hear the word for, forks and we also have halves. Doesn't mean that Bitcoin halves its value. It means each time we have a half is the, what the miners are being paid. Okay, because the original inception of Bitcoin is it would go up in value. As it goes up in value, okay, if a Bitcoin was paid say 25 Bitcoins, when Bitcoin was $10 for doing all this work, he was getting $250. Well, now if he got 25 Bitcoins for doing the same, basically the same amount of work, he would get what? 25 times 40,000 or $100,000, okay? So he gets less of a Bitcoin, but this was, like I said, is, is written in the Bitcoin 
setup, the original business model of Bitcoin. Now, when you hear about forks, forks are slightly different. Forks, because there's current, always current development going on. Okay, and there's newer ways to do things because blockchain was the original. When it forks, it's going on to a different computational algorithm matter that's more, that's faster, that's easier to use. Not changing the, the, the block, it's not changing the Bitcoin, it's not changing the value. Now, sometimes it can fork off like we got Bitcoin Cash and it, it could fork off and it's still Bitcoin, but, but it forked off because it's using a different system, so to speak. So Bitcoin allowed it to fork and Bitcoin Cash is, say, a sister of Bitcoin. And you could have either gone to Bitcoin Cash and done business in Bitcoin Cash and retained your Bitcoins, and it had a fork. So each fork is a stem off of the original blockchain and the original mathematical computerized development. Because, you know, as things change, computers change, as people change, as technology changes, the original formula and technology for the original blockchain, you need to keep progressing it into the future so that it stays, gets faster and faster, can handle the traffic, can handle the computations. And so this is also something else that the miners are responsible. So remember, there is no Bitcoin corporation. There's no Bitcoin developers working for Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin company who are paid money for doing any of this, okay? There is no development field. These are miners and, and, and other people involved in the running of the networks who are trying to make it more efficient, more stable, faster. It costs them less money to do their verifications and computations. Now, the ever-widening avail <coughs> availability of Bitcoin news has created tremendous amount of interest in the value of the currency but it also spreads uncertainty because it, remember, Bitcoin's not associated with any government. Social media news and headlines can send the prices up and can send the prices down. And like I said, just a few years ago, your mom, your dad, your grandma didn't know anything about Bitcoin. Now grandma and her, you know, her card club bought a Bitcoin, they invested in a Bitcoin. Well, all of a sudden, when millions and millions of more people start getting involved, even small amounts in this field, it's a matter of supply and demand, okay? There's only so many supplies for, you know, so many supplies for so much demand. So as, you know, with Bitcoin being in the headlines for the last couple of weeks and reaching, you know, over $50,000 and soaring from 23 to, to 40, all of a sudden, everybody wants to invest in Bitcoin. They want a Bitcoin. So if you say a million new trade, new investors came into Bitcoin and even bought a half of a Bitcoin a piece, well, that that took up a half a million Bitcoins that were in cir circulation. There's only so much in circulation. So what's it do? Well, if I had $2,000 to invest in Bitcoin and Bitcoin was selling at $2,000, I would have gotten a Bitcoin. I still only have my $2,000. So what am I getting now? I'm getting one twentieth of a Bitcoin because it drives the price up. So this explains why social media communication plays a vital role in pricing and valuing cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. The speedy sharing of information has even allowed traders in some situations to exit the market before losing too much of their investment in Bitcoin. However, certain tools can result in the purchasing of likes and can screw information. Fundamentally, Bitcoins derive their value just as anything else does because people want them. Like any other currency, Bitcoin followers or follows the basic rules of supply and demand. Currencies have always been useful tools to make trade easier, enable holders to convert goods into widely tradable commodities for sale, then use the proceeds of that sale to purchase nearly anything more. And this is why, personally, I put Bitcoin more into the field of a commodity. You, know, you buy gold in the commodities exchange, it's at the value that people are willing to pay for it. Now, there's things that drive it up and drive it down, but I can't walk into the grocery store and technically pay with gold. I'd have to find a gold dealer that I could sell the gold to, turn it into cash to go to the grocery store with it. So Bitcoin derives its unique value from the fact 
that despite its lack of official backing or wide acceptance, is generating an ecosystem in which many people are willing to trade and accept it. In fact, some perceive Bitcoin to be more valuable or more useful than other currencies in that it is a better option for certain purposes, such as seamless digital transfers and across border transactions. Information sharing is a vital part of developing and running a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Social media platforms have been the core part of the Bitcoin world since the currency's inception. If not before, in the future, this trend may well reverse. So, with Bitcoin, when we started out, they had to develop a payment network, just like Visa and MasterCard. You know, back I remember when I could start accepting Visa and MasterCard. You know, and American Express, you know, 40 years ago when I had this little, you know, you brought your credit card in and I ran it through this little machine and ran across it. And I would mail them all into Visa and then eventually I'd get a check in the mail. And, you know, eventually they licensed it to the banks and the banks became processors and it went through a big Visa network. Today, you know, somebody wants to use a credit card in somebody's store, they have the money in their account in seconds because they had to develop a payment network. So in order to have buyers and sellers, you have to have a payment network. The question becomes how to buy and sell and store these coins. And this is done, as I mentioned, by wallets and exchanges. Bitcoins and other altcoins are digital cash, a way of buying and selling things over the Internet. The first step is establishing a digital wallet via a browser-based web wallet or downloading a desktop or smartphone wallet. Your Bitcoin address as well as your public and private keys are generated automatically when you set up your wallet. Your Bitcoin address is typically an identifier of 26 to 34 alphanumeric characters beginning with numbers 1 or 3 that represent a possible destination for a Bitcoin payment. For example, 1, J, you can see what it represents, this long string of characters, or it can be in a QR code. And your wallet is basically your bank account. Now you need to get Bitcoins to deposit them in your wallet. And this is done via an exchange. Cryptocurrency exchange are online platforms where you can exchange one cryptocurrency for another or for fiat currency. In other words, depending on the exchange, it's either like a stock exchange or a currency exchange at airport or bank. Well, I hope this gave you some general knowledge of just Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is the only digital currency, so to speak. The rest are digital assets or digital coin. Very few other cryptocurrency coins that are, or cryptocurrency tokens are, are actually end out there for a form of exchange of value or exchange to buy, sell, shop, or e-commerce. Whether we're talking about Ethereum, we're talking about Ripple, you know, all of these are developed for specific uses outside of currency. And most of them are called altcoins. And even though they work on a blockchain um, and digital technology, they aren't. You don't buy an Ethereum and try to actually go shopping with it. Overstock.com and Microsoft don't accept Ethereum. They accept Bitcoin. This Bitcoin was more designed in the original assumption was as a currency. But today we have smart contracts. We have the Ripple Network, which is a payment network for businesses and banks to use to transfer funds around them, all working on blockchain. Okay, and the concept of Bitcoin, but they're not Bitcoin. And then we have all of the ICOs, we have all the tokens, and that's time for another class because we've had an hour of this and we've barely gotten through blockchain and Bitcoin and exchanges and wallets. But this gives you the first step into the world of cryptocurrency and the mysteries of cryptocurrency. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for supporting our Just Learn Academy, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now.